Um, without further ado, let me give a very brief introduction to the three speakers. So the first speaker, uh, Kate Kim, is an assistant professor on campus. Uh, she has completed her PhD at the University of Alabama, Alabama, and then she joined campus in 2016. Her primary research interest lies in empirical marketing modeling, especially in analyzing customers' various behaviors in retail contexts and how marketing interventions influence their shopping experience. The second um, speaker is Dr. Kran Duga. Uh, he's currently an assistant professor in marketing uh, on campus uh, in the College of Business, of course. His teaching interests include marketing strategy, consumer behavior, global marketing, marketing research, and international immersion programs. Dr. Duga's research interests are in deconsumption, consumer behavior, equity, diversity, and inclusion, technology consumer interaction, impact of culture and consumption, rash analysis, and mixed method in marketing. He has a PhD from the University of Denver and MBA from Ohio University. He has taught and has conducted research at universities in India, Bangladesh, France, Texas, and Mississippi. Uh, Dr. Duga teaches capstone class in marketing and involves students in hands-on consulting project with the Mayo Clinic Health Systems in Eau Claire. Uh, he enjoys collaborating with his current and former students on teaching and research projects. He also enjoys teaching his students about software and platforms such as SAP, SPSS, and uh, Microsoft Excel. Leading student groups into immersion programs in India, Bangladesh, and France have been some of the most fulfilling experiences of his career yet. When he's not in the classroom, he enjoys traveling, hiking, biking, scuba diving, watching cricket, and then reading for fun. Last but not least, Ms. Janine Fox currently is a lecturer on campus in the Management and Marketing Department. She teaches retail management, integrated marketing communications, social media marketing, and principles of marketing. She was a marketing practitioner who worked in internet marketing for 10 years prior to teaching. Most recently, she worked on project management for changes and enhancements to 10 e-commerce commerce websites. She also managed a photo studio in, and a staff. In the past, she managed email marketing, web analytics, product reviews, and on-site research. She then graduated from campus with a BBA in marketing, a BA in Spanish, and a certificate in business communications. She later graduated with a master's degree in business administration from this campus as well. She's originally from Walsall, Wisconsin, and now lives in Chippewa Falls with her husband, five-year-old daughter, two-year-old twin daughters, and a two-month-old daughter. So thank you very much, uh, all of you, uh, of course, for joining us. And please, as a reminder, mute your microphone, uh, except for the three presenters, of course. The platform is all yours. All right. Thank you so much for that great introduction, Catherine. Thank you also for being the force behind making all of this happen in terms of sharing it with the with uh, with everybody. Um, can everybody see my screen? Okay, very good. So. Um, I just wanted to start by saying thank you. Thanks to everybody who took the time to come here. This has been a long journey, like I was saying before. Uh, and it has been a collaborative research effort and wouldn't have been possible without each and everybody contributing, but also people in the background who supported us throughout these last two and a half years. Um, if you have any questions, thoughts, uh, please, you know, you can either put them in the chat function or um, ask them at the end of our presentation. So our study is called OK Google, what makes something smart? It's the conceptualization, development and validation of a scale to measure smartness of things. So we're going to take you through our presentation, just start with a reflection, maybe get everybody involved so that you can get a sense of what exactly we are doing. You don't have to be in business to understand what we are doing. We believe that this is something that touches all human beings. Uh, we'll take you through the literature review and gaps, 
and then talk about our research questions, uh, our study design. Uh, it was a mixed method study, both qualitative and quantitative. Kate is going to take you through the findings, uh, and uh, and also Janine will take you through the qualitative findings, and then we'll come back and maybe have a Q and A discussion and brainstorming. We're looking for feedback from everybody. So here's the reflection prompt. Um, have you ever named something you own? Have you named your car? Have you named your laptop? Uh, does your smartphone have a name? Is your car dependable? Is your smartphone sassy? Uh, I, have, I have named my car. My car, car is called the Great Blue because I am reminded of a great blue heron who is uh, sitting out there and thinking. Uh, we, we all do this, don't we? What we are doing really when we do this is this marketing concept uh, called anthropomorphism. Really difficult to pronounce, but I did that. Uh, refers, this refers to a tendency or attribute to um, uh, give human characteristics to objects. And so it, it could be manifest in ways such as my smartphone gets me, good job waking me up coffee, and Siri, how are you today? And then closely related to that is this marketing concept of brand personality, where we, uh, as consumers, attribute a set of human traits to product, services, offerings, or brands. I'm going to take you through a couple of examples, and these are very timely. Uh, it, it is very well known that Apple as a brand is looked at as sophisticated brand. That's the dimension of uh, brand personality that Apple is really strong on. And this one was really timely because this happened a couple of days ago. Um, McDonald's, the social media person at McDonald's was uh, almost crying for help because everybody just cares about when is the McRib going to be back. Uh, McDonald's, like other companies, has uh, anthropomorphized themselves so much on social media that people look at these brands as 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 people and so and the only the only thing they want is transactional when are you going to come up with the mcrib so uh, the manager of um, social media at mcdonald's came back and said that it would be nice sometime to hear you say how are you doing you know the person behind the account because th there's no line between the actual person and what the brand does and then of course all of these Technology related companies uh, replied in support of this idea that uh, COVID has been really tough on everybody and maybe we need to think about even um, the, the mental aspects of dealing with this uh, pandemic. And this again highlights the, the fact that brands become personalities on social media. Uh, we're going to show you one quick another example that will kind of crystallize what we are talking about here. It's time appliances had a personality. Yours. Introducing Cafe Modern Glass. The only collection of appliances with a sleek glass finish that reflects your style. Discover the full modern glass collection at cafeappliances.com. Cafe, distinct by design. The people at Cafe Glass absolutely understand that what brands really are are extensions or even a reflection, literally in this case, of who we are. So you are your car and your car, car knows a lot about you. And, and that's why I think that our study is very timely. Uh, this, is, this is a time when uh, people talk about technological singularity where machines will one day outsmart human beings. Uh, on social media, online, with big data, our behavior is tracked so uh, closely that even, even these uh, artificial intelligence uh, systems online are getting confused right now because our behavior is very unusual because we are in the middle of a pandemic. So, uh, it, it, you know, it goes without saying that the internet is on a rise. Not only that, there's a, a connection and network of these intelligent things interconnected to each other that are called the Internet of Things. Um, this is big business now. Not only is it important uh, for theory, but also for practice. The IoT market worldwide by the end of this year, according to Gartner, will grow 
to about $389 billion and to a, a staggering $1.6 trillion by 2025. Uh, and and for, for a field of study that is so important, uh, there's a lot of conceptual ambiguity there. People use different ideas of what uh, smartness of it or intelligence of a device could be. And there's a lack of consensus and harmony when it comes to smartness of things. So we looked at, uh, as a team, we looked at these gaps and we, we thought that there's a, definitely a gap between how important this is and how the inquiry seems to be lagging. Uh, the conceptualization of smartness or intelligence has been tried before when it comes to technology brands, but it's not a broad conceptualization. Uh, it, it, it's, a rather, it's a rather narrow one. Um, and smartness and intelligence have been used interchangeably to, uh, to convey the idea of what a smart object might be. Um, and then um, there is a lack of comprehensive organization as it comes to scale development. So we looked at all these things and we thought that where we can make uh, a contribution would be uh, at three levels, at the theoretical level, at the practical level, and also maybe at the methodological level. So uh, a broader or multidimensional conceptualization of this smartness is really called for in literature because uh, the meaning of smartness is different for, for all of us. And in the literature, there are not many studies that look at the consumer's point of view. Uh, and that's what we wanted to do. We wanted our study to focus on consumers' uh, perceptions of what smartness of a device or a thing might be. Uh, we use the tech terminology smartness of things just to keep things uh, uniform and uh, non-confusing. The way we looked at it from a theory point of view, we uh, pulled ideas from both tech-centric theories and anthropomorphic theories, uh, and that's how our study is different. Uh, we pulled from innovation diffusion, technology acceptance model, and user experience theories when it comes to technology, and when it comes to brand personality and human intelligence, we thought we could pull from especially four of these theories. The first one is the theory of fluid and crystallized intelli intelligence, uh, which says that part of intelligence is actually something that you learn over time, which really, as you will see, the dimensions that we came up, uh, it goes hand in hand with a couple of dimensions that we came up. Then the other part of intelligence is actually genetic, you're born with it. So this is really interesting because we think that devices are perceived as being smart or not smart depending on which company is actually making it. Uh, then there's the theory of multiple intelligences that has eight different kinds of intelligences and uh, the dimensions we came up with uh, are mirroring it, but we went beyond that. Uh, then there's Sternberg's triarchic theory, and finally the halo effect, which says that people who are good looking are perceived to be more uh, smart than people who are not good looking. Not only are they perceived to be more smart, they are perceived to be more dependable uh, and, and more human humanistic in a way, which, which perfectly ties in with the dimensions that we came in. So, so this is what we are trying to do here. We are trying to develop and validate a comprehensive measure of smartness of a thing from a consumer perspective. And the gaps that we are trying to uh, plug here and the contributions we are trying to make is that we are trying to build some conceptual clarity into this comprehensive measure. We came up with a scale of smartness of a thing we looked at it from the consumer's point of view. We looked at things like consumers and devices actually interact with each other. Uh, and user perceptions are really important when you're talking about uh, marketing and marketing of devices. We wanted to go beyond technology. We borrowed from it. But we wanted to go beyond that. We wanted to borrow from intelligence theories, but we wanted to go beyond that. And when you look at our 13 dimensions, I think that you might be able to see that we did go beyond that also uh, there's not been a contemporary measure of smartness of a thing in the literature so that's the contribution we are making because we know that technology keeps evolving all the time and and finally um, we wanted to look at value co-creation that's why the consumer perspective was so important uh, and we make contributions to theory method and practice 
So to talk about our research questions and the study design, I'd like to call upon Kate now. Okay, thank you, Kran, to um, start a very nice presentation. Uh, if you don't mind, can you please uh, click the small arrow button? I can see my face up here. Perfect, that's great, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna talking about the, our research questions. Based on the literature review and research gap that Kran discussed, we developed the three research questions what make an object smart, and what are the dimensions of consumer perceived smart of the things, and what does a valid scale of the SOT looks like? To answer the research questions, we decided to mix max of the research. So first, to conducting the qualitative study, and then the uh, quantitative study. For a qualitative study, we collect the data from the two different groups of consumers, 248 college students and 152 uh, Amazon MTOC panelists. For both groups of consumers, we ask them what attributes or characteristics make an object smart and list the four attributes that they think that's the object is smart. And also we ask them to list two smartness of the object that they have experienced and describe their experiences, engagement, and then the interaction with uh, the smart object. Uh, those are the things that we asked. Could you please go to go next, please? Thank you. This table shows what type of smart products that they mentioned that. So each individual uh, respond, respondents mentioned to two smart products. So for that reason, we actually got uh, 800 total smart products. The left column shows the list of the smart products from the college student sample. And then the right column of uh, the column shows the list of the product, uh, smart products from the MTOC panelists. So similarly, around 70% of 800 total smart <laughs> products they experienced and interacted with uh, is our smartphone, smart speaker, and laptop in both panelists. And around 30% of the smart, uh, smart products they mentioned that smart car, smart TV, and smart home appliances, and home securities, and so on. Can you move on to the next slide? Thank you. And we follow the procedure illustrated by Corbin and Strout, and we analyze open-ended responses together and create 41 sub-themes, and we create a code book. And four of us independently categorize the data set into the themes and re resolve any disagreement based on the discussion. And we regroup the similar ideas together, and we uh, obtain the certain dimensions as a result. And Jinin will be going over that, what we found as a certain dimensions. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. So the 13 dimensions that emerged from the research were the anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic, autonomy, competence, environmental agility, gateway, learning, novelty, real-time information processing, transparency, two-way communication, upgradable, user-friendliness, and visual appeal. I'll go through each of the dimensions briefly here coming um, coming up. Uh, one thing that I did want to mention as it relates to the dimensions overall is that they were um, seem to be dimensions that reflect the attributes that make an object smart from that consumer point of view. So as Kate mentioned through the research, we um, looked at consumers. So these were the dimensions that they um, thought reflected those attributes of smartness. So to move on, looking at that first dimension of anthropomorphic, Kron did a great job at the beginning of the presentation um, talking about that ideal of anthropomorphic from our uh, research. The definition that we uh, put to anthropomorphic is whether that object has abilities, behaviors, attributes like a human being and captures that user's attribution of anthropomorphism of that object. And one of the representative quotes that we got from a respondent was a smart or intelligent intelligent device is a device that can do everything humans can do with a human brain. I would define it as something that almost has their mi a mind of their own. It can do capabilities that a human can and oftentimes outsmarts a person. Um, next slide, please. And that next dimension being autonomy. And the way that we defined autonomy is 
is able to operate in an independent goal-directed way with minimal or no input from that user. And the representative quote for this dimension is that I think what makes a device intelligent or smart is whether or not it completes tasks without being fully guided by the user. So for example, if it can turn on the lights by a voice command instead of requiring the user to manually flip the switch or push a button on their device to do so, I would consider it to be smart. Moving on to competence, and that just looking at the device working error-free has a high performance quality. Again, representative quote being that a smart device is intelligent if it does what it's supposed to do extremely efficiently without failing after a short time. In environmental agility, uh, defined as is is constantly aware and observes its surrounding environment, reacts to the input from environment or the consumer, um, includes react reactivity as well as proactivity, and that representative quote being something that, algor that algorithms to learn how we act and behave to predict what people want and uses the internet to gather data and bring to life. Um, this one, the, the photo in the slide will go over every single um, photo, but this one with that uh, Nest thermostat, if folks are familiar with that technology, that that actually adjusts the temperature based on uh, user preferences, based on uh, times when it senses that humans are in the house and things of that nature. So that scanning, that sensing of that environment um, being a big characteristic in um, the smartness of a thing. Moving on to the next dimension of Gateway, it works like a hub for getting multiple functionalities in a single place compatible with other objects, so apps within a, a device itself being able to connect with uh, smart thermostats, smart refrigerators, smart light bulbs, and so on. Um, and then that representative quote, in my opinion, a smart device would be a device that has multiple functions to aid people with their daily lives, such as an alarm clock or having the device connect to other devices, Bluetooth, Google, etc. Learning, the next dimension, um, defined as is able to learn, make decisions, and solve problems. Representative quote for that dimension, something that has algorithms to learn how we act and behave, to predict what people want, and use the internet to gather data and bring it to life. It possesses in artificial intelligence. Uh, the next dimension being novelty and whether the object is novel by current standards. This captures the attribution of innovativeness, novelty in comparison to what is available or existing. And a representative quote for this dimension is, it is smarter than me, the user. A smart object has to be able to perform something that the user cannot. Real-time information processing defined as whether the object can process information in real time. This captures the more active as opposed to passive aspect of the information processing in that the object can process live real-time information. So it doesn't need to query a database of existing information. It can actually process what's happening at the moment. And that representative quote is an object that has the ability to process things at speeds that the human mind is not capable of. Transparency being another important dimension that emerged. It's transparent and clear about its roles and activities. So a representative quote, um, that it tells me where I'm going, what music I'm listening to, of my choosing, and if someone is calling me. So the device, the object, actually tells the user what it's doing and what's happening um, on that device. Two-way communication, another important dimension, it allows for two-way communication, can receive input from the user and be responsive, controlled and programmed based on the user's input. And an important note here, we looked at input not just being um, typing on keys, for example, it could be a touch input, it could be a voice input, and so on. So um, those, those various different types of inputs. And a uh, representative quote, I would say that if a device can talk back to you and respond to your questions, it is an intelligent object. 
um, upgradable being the next dimension. And uh, as it sounds, it can be upgraded with new technology reflecting latest or upcoming standards so that it does not soon become obsolete. And that representative quote, I would define smart intelligence device slash object if it is up to date with the current news and applications that many individuals are using today. And user friendliness uh, defined as is designed in a way that is user friendly, requires less cognitive effort from the user. Uh, smart intelligent device slash object is something that is relatively easy to use and has some sort of purpose. And the last dimension that emerged is visual appeal, and that's whether the object is good looking or aesthetically appealing. Um, like Kron mentioned, that relating to the theory of human intelligence, the halo effect, and that representative quote, in all honesty, I think the crisp and clean look of a device is what sells me on it. I know most phones and computers do the same thing. Now I'm going to turn it over to Kate to talk a little bit about that scale development process that we used. Thank you, Janine. So here is the overview of scale development process we have taken. So we followed the Anderson and Garvin and Churchill scale development process. And here are the uh, steps we have taken. So after we identified the certain dimensions from the qualitative study, we went back to the literature. So we start to collect all existing scales, which we thought that would be relevant to our construct. And we review that several marketing scale handbook published over uh, eight years and search that relevant research review thoroughly and collect as many as established items possible. And from the qualitative research and findings, and we also uh, developed our uh, scales as well. So for from the like the board's data sources, so we generate the uh, initial pool of 214 items that we thought that reflect attributes of smart uh, smartness of an object, and all of us individually uh, rated each item using a scale of one means the very bad fit to five uh, means like the very good fit, and we remove any items below the average of the three, and we review the all the remaining item and removed any redundant item we believe and modified unclear item based on the like consensus. And as a total, we retained 132 items. And then we conducted two pilot tests for scale purification. First, we invited 23 college students and asked them evaluate whether each item described the construct. Well, at the time, we provide the definition of each dimensions as well. And they provide the suggestion for improving the measures. And after improving the scale based on the, their suggestion, we also uh, sent out the survey to 173 college students to evaluate whether each item described the construct well with a seven point Likert scale with a range from one means like not at all descriptive to means extremely descriptive. After improving the scales, we also invite seven marketing researcher and professional expert in the technology industry to evaluate our uh, initial item scale. Dave, I personally, we personally thank you for your input for this one. Uh, and then also based on the, all the comments that we got from the expert, we modified the scale. And as a result, we got the re, uh, retained 116 item for uh, actual online survey. And after we conduct the three phase, uh, phases of the quantitative study, uh, uh, we conducted like three phases of the quantitative study. Uh, first one is initially designed for uh, conducting the exploratory factor analysis and complementary factor analysis and checked out some initial valid, uh, validation uh, measures. At the time, we recruited uh, more than 589, but we actually obtained got to the valid and complete responses. That's the number one, 589 samples. Uh, those samples actually came from the two different data sources. One is where students recruited their survey takers for, from the general population for class extra credit. And we also launched the Amazon MTOX panelist survey. And after checking that whether the, they don't have that much differences, we combined the data set and then we start to navigate the data. And after multiple iterative process, we went on and we removed any many items as possible, whether it's the low factor loading and then cross loading items. And we test our scale again with the second uh, the data, which we mainly collect the Amazon MTOC. 
since we use Amazon and talk panelist twice, so in the second uh, the survey, we added some filter options so that we can exclude the survey taker who already participated in the, our first study. And then we test, uh, retest all the validation of the pros, uh, scale from the second study. And we finally launched our final, uh, final survey with a large sample of US consumer throughout the Qualtrics online panel services. And we obtained 905 complete and barely the responses. And we also checked out the nomological validity of the scale by using the final study. Each of online survey respondents are valid and complete. We added three uh, attention, pick, attention filter questions and exclude all the survey takers who did not meet any of the attention filter questions at all. Okay, can you move on to the next slide? It was Thank you. So this table shows that actually the snapshot of the summary table about the measurement model of the feed statistic. As presented in the table, all the CFA models demonstrate that uh, satisfactory level of the model fit. We also test the convergent validity and discriminant validity for the three tests. And we also find some uh, acceptable result for both uh, test result as well. Good. Thank you. And now it's turn to Jinin to talking about the R scale items. Thanks, Kate. So we have, you can see a snapshot of our scale items. We'll have a couple of slides that look at each of the individual items. Uh, I'm not going to read through each individual item, but you can see on the slide here the um, dimension with the composite reliability. They all exceeded the threshold of the 0.7, and um, each of the dimensions, we had a minimum of three different scale items. Um, just looking at the first anthropomorphic, like I said, I'm not going to read through each of them, but you can see that we looked at um, items such as a smart object has human properties, a smart object is like, is like a person, a smart object behaves like a human being, a smart object has human-like personality, and um, asked our respondents in our quantitative study to evaluate um, how much they agreed or disagreed with each of those statements in terms of each of those items. Um, move on to the next slide, please. On the next slide, we have additional dimensions and their scale items. I'll pause briefly um, so you can just review the scale items um, on this slide. Again, all of the, um, the dimensions exceeded the threshold of 0.7 for the, the composite reliability. some additional dimensions on this slide. And then our final grouping of items related to their dimensions. With that, I will turn the, the mic back over to Kate to talk a little bit about the nomological validity. Thank you, Zinin. So we assess the nomological validity of SOT scale with the two mediator variables, utilitarian value and hedonic value, and one outcome variable, intention to use. So researches suggest that uh, smart objects, like many other new products, tend to change the consumer's value creation process. Also, existing literature suggests that smart objects may influence customers' behavior intention. So we propose that degree of customers a perceived smartness of the object is likely to increase the value perception of the consumers into different uh, the, the values, and the which in turn that influence the customer's intention to use. So based on that, we hypothesize, uh, hi, uh, we propose three hypotheses. The first one is SOT will have positive association with, uh, with utilitarian value and hedonic value. The second one is uh, both utilitarian value and hedonic value will have positive association with intention to use. And third one is association between the SOT and intention to use. It will be mediated by um, this utilitarian value and the hedonic value. Can you move on to the next slide, please? Thank you. So as a result of this nomological val validity test, uh, we actually confirm that all hypotheses are supporting. Uh, we've performed that SEM model. And as you can see here, model fit, and it shows the, some satisfactory level of the measurement. So we can confirm that our developed model have uh, some nomological validity. Mm. Now.
Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about the discussion very quickly. Uh, the we, what what our study has uh, ended at or found is that uh, smartness of a thing is a multi-dimensional construct, and we have uncovered new dimensions. Uh, like I said, no other study before ours has looked at 13 dimensions and such a comprehensive measure. And this is in line with evolving interactions and meaning that consumers place on uh, a, a smart object or a smart thing. Um, our, our scale is rigorously tested and psychometrically valid and reliable. We have made contributions at three levels that I briefly mentioned in the beginning from a theoretical point of view. Uh, it's important to know that the conceptualization of SOT hinges on consumers' attributions. Uh, consumers don't always have to be direct experiencers of uh, a smart object. Sometimes they could just be looking at a car like Tesla or they could have a uh, test driven one and, and that could have been enough. Uh, that indirect ex experience would have been enough. Our take of SOT has been both tech centric and human centric and hopefully we've gone beyond both of those as you have seen. From a methodological point of view, we uh, this mixed method study is, um, I won't say it's unique, but then not many studies have uh, done such a marketing related study from a consumer point of view with mixed methods before. Uh, for our qualitative phase, we use the critical incident technique, which was again, um, not many studies have done that before. And like Kate just mentioned, uh, we were able to validate this nomologically as well. So this study should uh, should make managers think. I think anyone who's in charge of brand management or new product product development needs to remember that, you know, a lot of technology companies, they will uh, develop a new product and then they will push it into the market without thinking too much about uh, the user. But, you know, user is king. Uh, the creator of the product is not the king and consumer perceptions do count and our study helps them look at that. Uh, one of the main things that managers could probably get from our study is they could use it a, as part of a multi-attribute model of attitudes to find the attitudes that consumers have about their smart product. Uh, they could uh, attach relative importance to each one of these 13 dimensions and figure out where they stand uh, in comparison to their competitors. Uh, attractiveness is always important, even though this is only one dimension that we talked about. I think it's re a really important one. And then never to forget the value co-creation. Uh, last night, I was looking through a lot of pictures that we took uh, over the last two and a half years, this team, Janine, Rocco, and Kate and I, and it took me a while to dish those pictures out. But I think that just like this study is very human, uh, this project has been very human, would not have been possible with the, without the help of Everyone at the College of Business and outside that helped us. ORSP that partially funded uh, parts of this study. And it has been quite a journey. There were frustrating times. There were some really good times. Um, but it all started with a casual meeting that Kate and I had over coffee. We invited Janine and Rokon into the project. That was two and a half years ago. And I'm happy to say now that we have reached somewhere. Uh, what has come out of this study? Uh, we, uh, this study got accepted into the American Marketing Association, the summer virtual conference. Uh, it was supposed to be in San Francisco, but obviously we couldn't travel. Uh, but we did get a lot of good feedback uh, from the American Marketing Association. And then, like I mentioned, ORSP was kind enough to grant a uh, competitive grant to us. The, the last phase of this study was partially funded with that support that we got from ORSP. And we are very happy to report that we finally were able to um, finalize the, our manuscript and we submitted it uh, not very long ago. We submitted it to the Journal of Business Research and it's under review over there. Where do we want to take it? We want to apply this to rash analysis, which is something that I uh, started in the end part of summer and we are currently looking at the data. We prepared the data in the summer and now we are looking at providing a rash analysis for this. We want to replicate this study uh, for more validity and reliability, especially in a cultural context. So we want to talk about South Korea, India and Bangladesh and see if these dimensions hold true there or are there some other maybe societal 
uh, uh, <laughs> dimensions there. We want to do a full uh, fledged, fledged uh, qualitative study. We want to give a grounded theory approach to this. Uh, this would be the right time to do that. So after we are done with the RASH study, we're probably going to do the qualitative study, in-depth, grounded uh, theory study. And we want to uh, apply this scale to a more complex structural SEM model. Uh, even though we have done some of this here, we want to actually make our model a little more complex and account for other variables that might be mediating or moderating. And we want to apply this to other consumer behavior concepts as well. At this point, I just want to thank everybody again for taking the time to be here. We would appreciate your questions, comments, thoughts, and feedback, and, uh, and we'll take them now. Thank you. Hey, I had a question for you. Uh, do you ever investigate you know, the, uh, trade, the trade off between uh, smartness and price? In other words, would I, would I take a dumb thing if it was way cheaper? Is there some, something in your conceptualization that, that uh, would address that particular issue? Whoever wants to answer, I'm perfectly happy to listen. Brian, you want to try? Yeah, that's a that's a good point, Bill. Uh, we we did not look at price as one of the variables, um, but then I, I guess your question your question is really good because in a way uh, we we did talk about in our presentation we talked about genes. Remember where does the product come from? What company makes it? And so I think that the price dimension is embedded in our discussion of even things like, how does my product look? What company is making it? What are the perceptions of that company? So, so obviously, you're absolutely right. Some, a smart device that a company like Apple makes will be qualitatively differently received than, say, a smartphone called Lava that I'm aware of because I come from India and it's a Chinese smartphone. So, so you're absolutely right. We we didn't we didn't want to uh, look at the price uh, per se, but we wanted to look at what does the price do in terms of where does this product come from, what company is making it, a and so to take it one step further, then in in our managerial uh, discussion, we should remind the company again that yes, it does matter uh, where. Uh, how, how consumers perceive your brand. So your brand might be perceived as either being cheap or not smart, or it might be perceived as being very sleek, sophisticated, uh, expensive, and therefore by an extension smart. So I that's a I, really good point. Yeah, and I, I, I took a note down about price as well. I think that would be interesting to look into perhaps in further studies. Another, just a, to add on to Khan's point about price is we were looking at attributes specific to the product or object um, as opposed to other parts of, of the marketing mix such as price. So we didn't um, directly take into account price in this study. However, that's a really interesting point to perhaps look into in the future. I guess so. Uh... I guess uh, I could probably somewhat answer my own question by the fact that if I'm in if I'm in the, the, the market for an Apple, whatever their latest phone is, or a Samsung, uh, the latest Note, uh, price isn't an issue. I'm looking for the smartest device I can put my hands on, you know. And, and uh, once you're that kind of a shopper, I, I maybe price isn't a real dimension. But one thing I like about your study and uh, uh, oh my gosh, did I ever get lectured on this so many times? And that would be show me a concept, show me a model, and then test it empirically. And uh, holy cow, you got you have all three. So I, I can see why this uh, could find a, a very fine home in the Journal of Business Research. Because that's what I, our, my mentors always said. You got to have all those or don't even start. You know, and uh, I, I, I have to admit I have just a whole resume of, uh, of publications that have just about none of the above. So nonetheless, but this one is really complete. I, this, this was enjoyable. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Um, can, you put, can you put up the slides where you are showing your final, kind of your list of attributes? 
and go back to maybe the, I don't know the first one of those slides where you have the um, was it the scale items that you're referring to Tim? Well, it was the characteristics. It was toward the end, the characteristics of a smart item, kind of your. Um, I think it might be the scale items, Cron. Uh, or were you referring okay, to the, up, the definitions yeah, of the individual more, dimensions? Go to the, the first of these. Uh, no, go down. Go to one of these. Let's take a look. Okay. Um, go up one more. Or maybe this one will be fine. Uh, Okay, is there one more that came before this one? Okay, let's use this. Uh, go up one more. This is the list it was doing. Go up one more. Go up one more. <laughs> Sorry. Is there another one? It was. I think it was one of the first ones. Maybe this is it. Okay. Um, I can't find the one I'm thinking of. Go down one more and I'll just use it. Maybe not the best example. I guess what I'm getting at is um, uh, there's lot, for example, there's lots of things that are not complicated to use. Um, there are lots of things that function reliably. So are we talking about things that make a smart op, op a smart op, object perceived as more useful or more value it seems like this um, there's attributes in here that are not unique to smart items and if we're asking the question what makes an object smart you know this is kind of like P implies Q but it's not the same as Q implies P um, yep absolutely we definitely talked I'm about that in the list that would describe could also describe other things that are not smart I guess is what I'm getting at so have we gotten away from the, are we still accurately describing what, are, what we're doing here? I think for some of these items, you're absolutely right, Tim. We, we definitely talked about that. And when we looked at some of these items, um, the fact that other objects may have some of these attributes or some of these items may apply to what users would consider non-smart items, the fact that um, an item or a, an object, excuse me, has or represents these different attributes and these different items is, um, and correct me if I'm using the wrong terminology, Kate or Kron, that's um, reflective of these attributes. So that's that's kind of what we talked about um, with a lot of discussion about, to your point, that uh, other items may have these these attributes or these items may be true of, of other types of items as well. Transmuted. Tim, it might also be important to remember that uh, when we were asking these questions, we framed it under uh, under the the uh, understanding, or we we did ask the users to say think think of a smart device that you've used, and think of the two most smart devices that you've used, and then tell us what those smart devices really do for you. So um, absolutely, some of these things might apply to non-smart devices and other kinds of products as well. But if we if we remember that uh, framing of the questions within that critical incident, then I think that um, we it can it it can be then applied to smart devices um, for sure. You said take an item that we you are going to define as being smart and and describe it. But but just just as I was answering your question, Tim, I just got an idea, mm -hmm. uh, which is like in the future, if we really want to understand what a smart device is, we might also might want to look at a negative case. So we might want to ask uh, some users, what is a device you've used that is not smart and you know, what are the characteristics of a non-smart device? And we might get a little bit more depth into the understanding of what a smart device really is. 
and whether it's different from a non-smart device. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if the definition changes over time. I remember when we used to talk about something called a dumb terminal as opposed to a smart terminal. And um, I'm guessing now pretty much every terminal you see is, we don't even call, bother to call it smart because there's no dumb terminals around anymore. Yeah, we definitely okay, talked about things like calculators and things like that that would have some of these would be some of these items would be applicable to, applicable to a device like a calculator, but obviously um, that's probably not the type of device people think of when they're thinking of a smart device. So yeah, to your point, it'll be interesting if in the future, essentially every device that has some sort of electronic component to it is is just a smart thing in general. Okay, how, uh, Catherine, how are we doing on the time? Do we have time uh, to take a couple more questions or? I think for folks who have the time uh, to, to stay on the, the platform, I, I think the, the platform is yours. You, you're free to do whatever you would like. Uh, I think there are people who had to leave because they have other uh, obligations, especially teaching at one o'clock. So, you know, for those who can stay and who still want to chat, please feel free. Uh, for those who can't, um, you know, but thank you to the speakers and thank you to all who attended uh, and participated. It's a great forum and hope we can keep doing this. So, have a good day, everybody.